Welcome everyone to today's talk, the fate of heavy metals in the soil environment and what's next. It is the 31st talk of a series targeting to promote agrobiotechnology and enhance understanding of the potential applications of agricultural products. We hope the series will inspire international scholars, researchers, farmers, and businesses in the agricultural field, as well as the interested public. First, let me introduce our speaker today, Dr. Li Wei Chi. He received his bachelor degree in applied biology, majoring in environmental science, and a PhD degree from Hong Kong Baptist University. After graduation, he was a lecturer and cost coordinator of environmental conservation studies at, at College of International Education, Hong Kong Baptist University. Wei Qing is now working as an associate professor in the Department of Science and Environmental Studies, and his current research mainly focuses on soil pollution, metalloid uptake, and accumulations in rice plants. Large area of agricultural fields in Asia has been contaminated by heavy metals from mining and other human activities. Due to a serious shortage of arable land, and the demand for an ever-expanding population. Crops are still commonly grown in contaminated land. For example, arsenic has highly toxic effects on plant growth and its concentration exceeds a threshold value. And high concentrations of arsenic in paddock soils results in grain yield reduction and higher arsenic concentrations in brown rice. Consequently, Remediation of heavy metal contaminated agricultural soils is urgently needed for safe food production and to protect human health in these areas. In this talk, Dr. Lee will present research related to vital remediation and the studies of industrial byproducts, plant growth promoting biosobacteria, biochar, food anatomical properties, etc regarding the rice growth performance and heavy metal uptake in contaminated soils. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Lee to the floor. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, both physically and also uh, in the internet. First of all, thank you so much, Professor Lan, for your kind introduction. Okay. And yes, this is Wai from actual Hong Kong. Let me introduce a little bit. Uh, actual Hong Kong now is not just for uh, training teachers because we also offer supplementary program. For example, in my department, uh, Department of Science and Environmental Studies, we also offer a Bachelor of Science program in Integrated Environmental Studies, Integrated Environmental Management. And we also cons uh, a focus on sustainability and also some STEM education. Here's some uh, background of my uh, of the place that I'm working. And now let's take a look, okay? Or uh, as you can see the title, we focus on the fate of heavy metal. As you may all know that in our environment, we have so many kinds of pollutants. Um, they of course are organic one, inorganic one, okay. And now I will only focus on heavy metal and see how this is actually working, the running, operating, upticking, whatever in the soil environment. And let's also think about how could we handle that kind of pollutants back down in the environment. Okay, as I mentioned, there are different sources of the different sources of uh, uh, pollution, just like flu by urbanization, industrialization, even for agriculture. As you may aware that some kinds of low quality fertilizer actually uh, it contains quite a lot of pollutants and of heavy metal. And for my part, uh, my research mainly focus on mining activities. And of course, I will focus how pollutants like heavy metal released by the mining activities and how it's gold and also through the food chain and even it eventually goes up to human. And let me take a look here, okay, the yellow dots, these are the heavy metal. Once they be released from uh, human activities, where will they go? Okay, they will eventually go to the environment. And you may be aware that uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics is they are not biodegradable. Bio That's mean, they will only store with uh, in the soil, okay, in the sediment. But they are not just stored up. They are not just locked up. They will eventually be released, okay, from the sediment to the water, okay, 
and eventually goes to the food chain, maybe buy some fish, okay, but ultimately to human beings. So that, oh, this is a cycle. This is a cycle. So that we, we have to think about how can we um, handle okay, all this kind of pollutants. Our aim is to protect our human health, okay, but how can we ensure, how could we work for the food safety? And we try to uh, use different angle to see which one is the best, okay? Not just for us, but also at the same time uh, to the farmer, because you know, um, they might not be well educated, but somehow they're very important. The important stakeholder, somehow directly related to our human health. So let's see what we can uh, um, think, okay, on the perspective from the farmer. How can we help them at the same time to ensure our safety as well as, well as human health? Okay, here shows a very uh, quick summary of what I'm actually going to do. In old days, okay, 20 years ago when I uh, was doing my PhD, I mainly focused the faith of heavy metal in water, soil, sediment. Okay, but I didn't work much on air because eventually once there's rain, uh, the pollutants will go down, okay, through uh, the rain to the water, to the soil. So I just focus on these two parts. And my PhD supervisor is Professor M. H. Wong. And at that moment, okay, we are still working on the environmental accumulation. This is how these pollutants being uptake, accumulate in different kinds of food, in different kinds of plants, so on and so forth. And my major duty of the PhD is to find ways to clean up the pollutants. Okay. And of course, once we clean up, okay, that means they are free in the soil, in the plant, that would be easy. But nowadays, Okay, we seldom think about this one because it's two times. At the same time, as a farmer, um, I think they don't like it because when we're doing the cleanup, uh, technology cleanup remediation, basically the farmer has to stop all the activity for a few years. So this is basically impossible for the farmer as a kind of sustainability. So we, we try to use different angles to see if we allow the farmer to grow at the same time, okay, while cleaning up the pollution. This may be one of the uh, uh, area that we could consider. And now, what is the next step? Do we also still allow such condition? Any other simple way to avoid the pollution that's being uptake? Let's discuss in this PowerPoint later. Okay, so in old days, okay, uh, let me share with you some uh, technology, which is we call phytoremediation. Let's talk about 20 years ago. Uh, actually, phyto, you can see, um, means plant, means plant. And you can see there are different kinds of reactions. For example, volatilization, that means once a pollutant being uptake, okay, somehow they, they will be somehow uh, being degraded to a less toxic form or even uh, volatile form, okay, be released in a volatile form. Most likely, this will be treat those uh, uh, methylone. And you can see there are an other phyto technology, just like phyto stabilization. You can guess from the stabilization that's mean using plant to stabilize the metal, fix it in the soil. And then there are phyto degradation, okay, on the top. That's mean they're using plant itself to degrade the organic pollutant only, but not for the metal. And phyto filtration, okay, so and so forth. But for my research, I mainly focus on phyto extraction. Right, of course, you can guess which is uh, we use the plant to uptake uh, the pollutants, and then the pollutants will translocate from root, which is a kind of extraction, extract pollutants, extract the metal from the soil to the plant itself, and then they will accumulate, okay, on above ground tissue, on the leaf, so and so forth. So that when we just harvest it, okay, cut the above, above ground tissue, that's okay because it was just being removed. It. And there are some other side business because uh, you may see the other term phyto mining. This means some businessmen will use this uh, uh, plant tissue, okay, the harvest from this uh, plant to extract the metal. That would be much easier because, frankly speaking, uh, in the metal ore, I mean, in the mining activities, the concentration, heavy metal concentration in the metal ore, it's talking about two to five percent. Okay, that's mean talking about twenty thousand ppm. Okay, but for this kind of plant, okay, uh, we call to a hyper accumulator. It could uptake talking about twenty to thirty thousand ppm sink. Okay, or for the other kind of heavy metal, that would be one of a very good potential source for mining. We call phyto mining. But uh, let me 
clarify that most of the plant, basically, they will uh, accumulate the pollutant in the root itself, in the root, but not translocate to the above ground. But these special plants we call hyper accumulator, they have a special tolerance uh, mechanism, so and so forth. So that's why they could tolerate and also export. And so many have their record. And this is a very special plant, Sadium Ephradii. Okay, uh, this plant provides me an opportunity to, to, to pursue my PhD. Without, the, without this plant, I can't get it. Okay, this is a cadmium and zinc hyperaccumulator. Very tiny, just like a palm size, basically. And you can see uh, on the left hand side, which is a control condition, this means just a nutrient solution. And the right hand side, which is uh, inoculated with, uh, uh, spiked with cadmium. The solution and what you can see the plant grows happily okay healthily no problem no problem and what you can see on the right hand side is the concentration of cadmium okay in the shoot talking about 5000 ppm normally cadmium i think you guys will know that it's a very toxic element if we can find around a few cadmium a few ppm on the above ground Basically, you can find some toxic effects, yellowing, okay, drop, leaf drop, so and so forth. But these tiny plants can hyper, we call it super, hyper accumulate the pollutant up to 5,000. While for the roots, just around 1,000 something. So they would be a very nice potential candidate to clean up the pollutant, to extract, we call it extraction. At the same time, we also found not just cadmium, it can also tolerate to very high concentration of zinc. And even accumulate, talking about up to 25,000 ppm. This is super crazy, super crazy. So this is what actually I have been done on the final remediation on this kind of plan. And to echo, to talk about the topic, the faith of heavy metal, I would like to uh, just use one slide to share. When we talk about the faith, uh, we have to know how it's actually going, uh, uh, working in the soil. We have several forms, okay? For example, the total heavy metal, total heavy metal. But of course, it will also spread into the available form and not available form. So the not available form, normally they will just become a residual, residual fraction. That means they're very stable, very stable in the soil. But at the same time, there are the other form, water soluble form, exchangeable form, okay, organic uh, metal fraction, they bind to. So these are the working parts, okay? The available parts of heavy metal that's uh, working, running, operating in the soil. So when we talk about the faith, okay, we will use the available form as well as not available form to represent. And of course, when we're going to clean up the solution, clean up the metal, we, we expect, okay, if they are very active, if they are available in the soil, that would be nice. That would be nice for this kind of plant to take up. Okay, but as a farmer, they prefer they are not active. They prefer they are just bound with the residual part. They prefer they are very stable because once they're stable, they will not go to the, uh, they, they will, they will not be active by the plant. So that's, there are some dynamics. Uh, how, how should we work with the heavy metal activities? But of course, uh, when we're doing the research on the hyper accumulation and mainly focus on the mobilization at this moment. Okay, so here shows one uh, uh, quick uh, uh, research data showing that actually when we are working with the hyper accumulation technology, we are not just working with the plant alone. At the same time, we try to uh, consider the rhizospheric bacteria at the same time. These are something nice, okay, not bad guys because they're living with the plant. And of course they may have some mutualistic activities. So I try to uh, visit different farm uh, in Hunan, in Zhejiang province. And then we isolated different bacteria, okay? And let's see, okay, we try to inoculate the bacteria with, okay, just on the agar plane. For example, with the zinc oxide, zinc carbonate. If you know something about chemistry, you will be aware that this kind of oxide, carbonate, they are fully soluble. This means not soluble. When we put this zinc oxide, zinc carbonate in the agar plate, they did not. They did not. They did not dissolve. They um, somehow uh, use the form as a powder, some white box on the agar plate. And interestingly, when we inoculate bacteria with these zinc oxide, zinc carbonate, after a few days, we found there are some clear zone, some clear zone on the agar plate. 
somehow this actually means that this kind of zinc oxide, zinc carbonate, they are being dissolved, okay, dissolved and become available, become available. And this gives us some insights to see, oh, how come this interesting bacteria can work with the hyperaccumulator? And of course, eventually we found that they, this, this kind of bacteria, they release organic acids, and this organic acids assist uh, uh, the mobilization of the heavy metal. And here shows, we tried to um, inactivate the bacteria with different kinds of heavy metal, uh, including cadmium, uh, insoluble cadmium form, such as just like the cadmium carbonate, zinc oxide, lead carbonate, lead hydroxide, so on and so forth. And what we found is most of the heavy metal compound, they are also being mobilized, okay, mobilized. At the same time, we found the pH drop, okay, pH drop to around three to four. And we take another uh, investigation why the pH drop, okay? And luckily we found that, oh, these compounds are the organic acid, okay? Organic acid, they are the tartaric acid, so in organic, uh, tartaric acid, citric acid, formic acid, so and so forth. And this mobilization of the heavy metal as well as the organic acid release actually form a very uh, uh, positive correlations. So that we, we propose that this um, salt chain organic acid release by the bacteria actually doing a conducive effects to the pipe accumulator so that it could not just uh, protect the plant itself, but at the same time, it can mobilize the metal and enhance the fire extraction efficiency. And we also try to inoculate the bacteria uh, in a real soil because in the previous part, we uh, mainly work in a in a hydroponic solution because uh, it is a little bit difficult to extract the organic acid from the soil condition. So that this part of the research mainly done in a hydroponic solution. But we also try to inoculate the bacteria with the uh, with different types of uh, polluted soil, okay, with green concentration as well. And with the tool and NOVA uh, analysis, we found the major effects basically, which is caused by the bacterial strain instead of the polluted soil. So it is it's actually further proved that bacteria is acting, it's actually working very well in mobilizing the pollutants in the, in the soil and also in the water conditions. And of course, we didn't stop. We also uh, uh, tried to inoculate the bacteria in a real soil condition, okay? And then we mimic as a soil column, as a soil column. And of course, the soil, uh, which has come from an authentic uh, contaminated soil, okay, which contain cadmium, lead, zinc, so on and so forth. And the soil column is talking about around 20 cm, which is similar to the authentic case. And let's see, we have been conducted a single chemical extraction, and the results are very straight. We found the solubility and mobility of these metal increased significantly, as well as with some pH drop a little bit. This is a very nice negative correlation. At the same time, besides the single chemical extraction, we also consider a sequential um, chemical extraction to see the metal speciation as well as the mobility. And of course, we found that yeah, the, 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 the solution of hydroxide and also the cold precipitated metal also increase as well. And what we found is the residual fraction, okay, which is at a very low, okay, not very, it's a relative low, okay, when compared to the control. That means uh, the bacteria actually did a good work in mobilizing most of the heavy metal. And of course, uh, we, we work on this uh, soil column. The aim is to mobilize and also enhance the extraction. But we also worry about it. Would the bacteria, I mean, would the metal go down? Okay, right. We, we found the, the bacteria somehow mobilized the metal. And with the gravity, you can see somehow it induced the metal movement downwards. That means you may consider it might cause secondary pollution, but actually the leach portion is rather small when we compare to some uh, chemical, okay, some leaching chemical just like EPA, so on and so forth. The effects is rather somehow under our control. So that's although it somehow induced metal, uh, induced metal downward movement, but it's actually safe. It's actually safe because suppose the plant should have enough time to uptake it before it goes down further.
Okay, so that uh, we, we, we will say that with using this kind of bacteria, it will be a nice solution, okay, in cleaning up the pollutant. At the same time, it will not cause any uh, severe secondary pollution to the downwards, just like underground water, river, so on and so forth. So we will say this is an environmental friendly technique at the old days, okay, old days. And of course, uh, we, we try to inoculate the bacteria, okay, with the plan, okay, in the real condition. And to prove the work is actually done by our bacteria, the Beholdia cepacia, uh, one of the control, we try to add an emphysilin, which is uh, antibiotics, a very strong antibiotics to kill, to inhibit all the bacteria, including ours one, so as to uh, uh, ensure this is a control. And what we found is, okay, of course, the metal up increase. At the same time, we found the plant growth also increased. Nutrient uptake also increase, as well as the tolerant index of the mantle, and also transportation of the mantle. Okay, from the root to chew, it is also significantly uh, it be improved. It's, okay, by the stimulation of the organic acid reductions. So that's uh, it's a very nice bacteria working very well mutualistically with this hyperaccumulating class. Okay, so um, this is just a very quick introduction, and as I mentioned. If we are keep using this hyper accumulating plant, that the problem is Apex basically all the activities, farming activities should be stopped. We stop this for a few years at least before the soil is ready for farming, for agriculture. But as a farmer, just like a rice farmer, I think they, they can't wait. They can't wait. If they stop all these agricultural practices, I think they cannot support their well being. So, once I joined it um, actual Hong Kong, I tried to use another perspective, okay? How the farmer would think, would they adopt our technology? If we are, if we are still using the hyper accumulating plants, I would say if I, were, if I were the farmer, I won't adopt it. I won't adopt it. So um, what could we do? Okay, let's see in the, in, the, in the latest slide. And before we jump to the rice, okay, I think rice, you guys will know it very well. Okay, as a Chinese, we eat rice every day, okay? And basically around half of the population in the world, they will eat rice or, or, or related products, okay, every day. So, but I think you may not be aware that rice is also a metal accumulating plant, okay? Where would this metal be accumulated in the rice? They are not in the roots, no. They are not in the stem. They are also not in the husk, rather in the rice grain. Okay, in the rice grain. So that, oh, this is a, a, a problem, it's a headache to most of us. Uh, but in Hong Kong, as we found that most of the rice basically are imported in, uh, from Thailand, from Vietnam. And so far, uh, we found these uh, products, I would say pretty nice, as safe, as safe. But unfortunately, we found some rice product which is imported in China. I don't know the source, but in the newspaper, you can find that talking about 40%, um, 40% of the rice product from the market okay, in Hong Kong. Okay, in Hong Kong, if, of course, uh, if they mention that the rice is imported in China, 40% of them are polluted. 40% is a very high number by cadmium, by lead, so on and so forth. So that's, that's somehow we have to pay attention. How can we uh, solve this problem? Because we have to eat every day. So uh, I have to, I have visited different uh, farmland, okay, in China, in China. And this one is in Guizhou, okay, in Guizhou, which is near a mercury and cadmium uh, site, right? A mercury and cadmium site. And unfortunately, we found that there are mercury mercury, cadmium, and different kinds of heavy metals are in the rice products, okay? For example, for the total mercury, which is 8.5 times exceeding the safety guideline, and for the cadmium, which is talking about 1.8 times exceeding the safety guideline. And we try to put input this data, okay, and to estimate some human health risk assessment. And for the total hazard portion, okay, normally when we take a look on the paper, they will only focus on one hemi metal. Actually, in the real condition, I think in the soil, most of the sites, frankly speaking, they are multi, okay, multi-polluted by various kinds of pollutant. 
and we try to input. Okay, only this, only this three. Okay, I didn't man, I didn't analyze all, but by just these three: mercury, methyl mercury, methyl mercury, which is the uh, the toxic form, most toxic form of mercury in the in the uh, as a mercury type, cadmium. And what we found is even just mercury itself is one point seven. What does this mean? If this is higher than one, then maybe have a very high risk of some hasa. Okay, some hasa. So by mercury is 1.7, methyl mercury 1.7, for cadmium 2.5. So HI is a health index, which is the accumulative effect. Same if this is higher than one, that means there's also some uh, high risk of different hazard effects. So by just this one metal mine, okay, we can find that the human, human health risk assessment is actually providing a very alarming result. Okay, alarming results in China. And I think there are quite a lot of similar conditions not just in white job, but also in other profits. And not just for adult, but also for children, okay, the condition is very similar. And we also found in the brown rice, okay, uh, most of the mercury that actually exists in the methyl mercury form. That is as what I just mentioned, is the most toxic form. So that's why uh, this is out of our expectation. And of course, uh, we interview, or somehow, if we have a casual chart with the farmer, okay, and we ask them, okay, how would you handle this rye? Would you consume them? And frankly speaking, the farmers say they didn't eat, but they will sell them to the other district, not their own district, not their own town. Because without selling this rye, they cannot support their well being. So I, I think the farmer should have certain perception of the quality of the rice, but somehow they can do nothing. They can do nothing. In this case, uh, with this concept bearing in mind, we're trying to help the farmer. Could we allow them to grow the rice at the same time? But I mean, in the contaminant side, okay, instead of stop all the activity and clean up first, because clean up first is impossible. As I mentioned, they have to wait several years. So now uh, we try to locate, uh, identify some um, acidic paddy field, okay, acidic paddy field in China. And we found uh, if it is possible to use some agriculture rescue or some industrial byproduct, just like steel slab, which is a byproduct from the stainless steel factory, uh, fine ash, okay, limestone, I think you guys know it very well, and also bioorganic fertilizer, which is a very famous and common fertilizer to be adopted by the farmer in China. And I have a check, this kind of bioorganic fertilizer which including some uh, amino acid fertilizer, some cow manure compost, as well as bacillus bacteria. And right, we try to compare, okay, if this kind of uh, uh, alkaline or even bioorganic amendment could assist, okay, the pharma, and of course the aim is to reduce the uptake. So let's see if they could uh, uh, solve the problem. We focus on cadmium, lead, and also zinc, and of course, more important, the rice grain eel. And in general, we found that uh, for the, let me see, for the steel slab, okay? Steel slab, they can actually do a very good job. It can reduce the soil bioavailability because steel slabs, most people would think that, oh, they are just a, a byproduct from a stainless steel, just like stone, okay? We never think that it could do a good job. They could reduce the soil availability, okay? Not just for cadmium, but also for other kinds, up to 90%. And not just availability being reduced in the soil, at the same time, the rice accumulation, okay, also drop. For the limestone, I think uh, undoubtedly this could be very nice because it could uh, affect the pH as well as reduce the bioavailable uh, metal in the soil. But what we are somehow uh, being alerted is the bio fertilizer. That's most of the farmer will use. Uh, we found that we found that the fertilizer will remobilize. That means it will activate, okay, even further mobilize the metal in the soil. That is actually an alarming problem for the farmer. And of course, we suggest them stop using this kind of fertilizer because they think they will be good. But rather, in this case, some some ash, okay, or even some uh, uh, industrial byproduct are actually doing a very nice job here. And then um, this steel slab could be a feasible and also a ecologically friendly remediation treatment for the acidic paddy soil because it can also control the pH as well and also improve the crop growth as well. 
And then we try to have a, uh, a detailed investigation with just the steel slag, okay, which is a byproduct from the stainless steel battery. And we found that oh, the steel slags actually contain calcium, silicon, ion, and also phosphorus. That's mean they are not rubbish. They are not some byproducts. Actually, it could be a safe, okay, or, or amendment, okay, for farmer that's to grow their rice on a contaminated soil. That could be useful for remediation as well as the uh, agriculture as well. So they could be a, a solvent, we call a kind of bio solvent. And what we found is, you can see, um, we tried to locate different mine sites on the upper part and also lower part. And what we found is uh, the poor water cadmium. This is available cadmium concentration in two mines, in the two mine sites are both significantly lower, okay, than the control. That means this steel slab did a very good job in uh, stop the mobilization of the cadmium in the water. And of course, we are not just talking about the metal concentration in the water. What we concern is the food that we eat. Okay, it's a cadmium concentration. Okay, after we add the steel lead in both sides, the concentration dropped significantly, okay, up to 72%, and which is also safe. Okay, now becomes safe. Okay, just 0 0.05, okay, which is actually, actually very nice as a, as a safe good, okay, and for that district. So that uh, we try to find, oh, uh, as I mentioned, it contains very high concentrations of calcium, okay? And if you know that calcium is somehow pretty similar to, to cadmium, okay? Chemically, the size, the properties. So that I would say that cadmium and also calcium, somehow they are compete themselves. That's being uptake, okay? So that the calcium will decrease the total cadmium influx, okay? Uh, in the root, to, to be uptake by the root. Same time, we also found that the steel slats also contain very high concentration of silicon, okay, which is a kind of rare earth material, and the silicon somehow also do good as well, okay. So that we also found a very nice negative correlation uh, with the extractable soil silicon as well as the concentration of the uh, of the cadmium in the rice itself. So that with these two properties with the calcium and also with the silicon that will also support the steel slab to be a very nice absorbent you know, amendment or uh, uh, to be applied to be adopted by the farmer in this kind of production for uh, rice grow. Okay. So as, as I mentioned uh, uh, in the authentic condition, we try to see uh, not just for cadmium but also for arsenic. This is another um, challenge to us because cadmium and also arsenic now they are somehow uh, they have opposite opposite reaction okay maybe to the bacteria to the flooding condition okay to the organic uh, to the DOC so and so forth so we try to see and we luckily identify a site with these two kind of pollution and we also try to use a common practice which is applying organic manure Okay, uh, in this kind of uh, contaminated site with the plant, with the rice plants uh, cultivation. Right, with this organic manure, of course, the grain yield increase. Okay, at the same time, it can reduce the cadmium. But unfortunately, we found that we cannot get one stone for two birds because at the same time, the arsenic concentration was found to increase. This is also out of expectation. And also we are sorry to the farmer. We cannot solve the problem by just using organic manure alone. So you can see for the cadmium concentration, cadmium cases, okay, when we apply the organic matter, so black bar, which is uh, the control. Once we add the organic matter, you can see which is a significant drops of cadmium concentration, the rise, okay. But for the arsenic, okay, the condition is opposite. Once we add the Organic matter, the concentration of arsenic in the rice is significantly increased. And maybe, you know, when we grow the rice, the condition basically, which is a flooding, reducing condition. And under this condition, maybe the organic manure somehow will activate, activate the bacteria and somehow eventually induce the arsenic solubility. But for the cadmium, uh, it's opposite, okay, because the reaction is totally opposite, reverse. So that in this case, we will say that organic manure, somehow they could do good for cadmium accumulation. 
but they're not doing very well for the acid accumulation. That means we can at least can let the farmer know if the soil is just cadmium contaminated or some uh, positive iron contaminated. Well, you can use organic matter. You can, you can use organic manure. But if you found your, your soil is polluted by arsenic, okay, or mercury, so and so forth, then you should not use organic manure. Otherwise, you will even increase the uptake, okay? So that in this case, uh, uh, it seems organic matter, I mean, in organic manure seems not doing very well in this case. And we try, in, the, in the past few years, we tried another technology, which is a biochar. I think all you should know about just is very popular in the past few years. And of course, this kind of biochar in this case, in, in, in this research, we're not just using a typical one. We try to amend with uh, sulfur, okay, and also with the iron. Because biochar, I think you should know, which contain very high concentration of carbon, okay, uh, deuces and so forth. It could also do good to the soil fertility as well as for the microbial growth, because we found that the microbial growth or microbial index somehow is an indirect indicator for the soil health or even for the plant health. So that at this time, we also consider the soil microbial diversity index in this part. And for the sulfur and iron, I think this is a very well-known okay, material that's to reduce the medical trans transport or medical availability in the soil. So that's why we try to uh, incorporate this two kind of uh, mineral with the biochar production. The object objective is to uh, uh, to investigate if there's two friends, okay, the sulfur and also iron modified biochar uh, do good on the cadmium immobilization, as well as on the microbial community, uh, uh, cadmium availability, so and so forth. And we found one site in Hunan province, in Hunan province. But let's see the normal range of cadmium, okay, which is rather low, okay, 0 0.01 to 1 ppm. Okay. The world means it's around 0 0.36. So if the soil contains around one or a little bit above, this is muted. And now we found this site is 33 ppm. This is extremely high, the total. And for the availability, it's talking about 4.7. So I would say this is a highly polluted site with cadmium. And this is our target. And we can also use this site to test whether our biochar is doing, doing good. And in the site. And the source of the biochars, we're using some bamboo hardwoods, okay? And of course, we add the sulfur and also iron okay, in, during the production. Okay, we have different uh, uh, trimming to control the uh, biochar alone, and also sulfur with the biochar, and also sulfur plus the iron with the biochar. So let's see, uh, with the SCM, we, at least we can find that uh, it contain a very sharp peak for the sulfur and also for the iron. It's actually proof that this is a successful impregnation, okay, and the biochar itself. And then we found that, right, the soil organic matter, okay, after uh, a several incubation uh, uh, period, we found the soil organic matter was increased successfully with the biochar uh, 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 addition, okay. And of course, this biochar as I mentioned, which is rich in a carbon source so that it can provide a very good uh, DOT, okay? And this DOT, of course, they could somehow uh, immobilize the cadmium so as to reduce the rise of plate. So that this carbon is not just provide a, a, a good source to improve the soil fertility, but also control the cadmium availability as well. And here it shows the relationships with the DOC as well as the available cadmium concentration in the, in the soil. This is a negative correlation. And they can, of course, immobilize the cadmium. And here it shows yeah, the soil available cadmium, right? And what you found is with the sulfur iron uh, addition, it can actually significantly decrease the soil available cadmium very sharp. And they also have some synergetic effects on the soil cadmium as well. Okay, last but not the least, we also found that the uh, residual faction, okay, that's uh, for the biochar treatment, the sulfur at the biochar and sulfur ion at the biochar. What you found is the residual faction is increased, increases, while the 
mobile fraction, okay, exchange, exchangeable fraction, carbonate fraction, actually decreased significantly. So it's actually proved the speciation of the heavy metal in different form of the cadmium in different form is also being reduced significantly. So that's the immobilization effect is very significant. And of course, as I mentioned, enhance the residual fraction of the cadmium. And here shows the soil bacterial community. So on the right hand side, you can find we try to use different index, okay, the, the cow index, uh, so on and so forth. And on the right hand side, the sulfur at the bow chart and the sulfur ion at the bow chart, they also significantly increased. Okay, so that's or whatever the bio community, like the abundance, richness, diversity also improved us. So that's these kind of bio charts work very well, okay, in the soil, with material as well. So this is a quick highlight, this kind of bio chart. I, I mean, not the traditional one. I, what I focus, which is the sulfur modify and also sulfur I modify. They improve the pH, okay, improve the soil organic matter, as well as decrease the BDP a tractable cadmium. So that would be a very nice potential candidate to uh, uh, apply that, okay, with the farmer when they are doing the rice cultivations. So I, I'll try, try to stop a little bit here because just a very quick re recap. In the first phase, we try to um, clean up the pollutants before we do the farming. And in the second phase, we try to consider about, uh, we try to grow the plant okay, at the same time when we're doing the, some, some treatment by adding different types of amendment. But as a farmer, as a farmer, we try to ask them, is this possible? Is this workable, practicable? Frankly speaking, some farmers said, depends on the money. If we have budget to buy the amendment, if the government support them, that's no problem. But somehow the perception of the, of the farmer on this kind of pollution is not very high. Okay, so we think that if we are keep using the amendment uh, uh, when they are doing the uh, plants or rice cultivation, it seems this is not long lasting. Every time they have to add, they have to renew biochar the amendment. So we are thinking, could we somehow not clean up the soil and also not add amendment? It is possible. And the farmer say, yes, if you can do it, okay, we love to try. We would love to try. So with this concept in mind, we try not to touch on the soil. We try not to touch on the soil. Not touch on the heavy metal. Just leave it, whatever the available form, total form, whatever. We try to focus on the plant itself. Okay. So here, as we know, the rice, which is accumulating plants, the accumulated metal from the root to the shoot and also to the grain. As soon as it's impossible to touch on the stem to the grain. So we work on the rice root. We work on the rice root. So on this PowerPoint, you can see uh, we found that for some rice cultivar, okay, or some rice strain, if they could uptake more cadmium, because we found that the structure, the morphology of the root itself is significantly different. At least you can see the size, the root length, okay, uh, the, the network of the root itself is totally different for those rice strain who uptake less heavy metal. This is easy, okay? But at the same time, besides um, the morphology, okay, the number of, number of uh, root, get okay, the diameter, we try to take a look on some channel, okay? Some channel, some uh, uh, apoplastic pathway. Apoplastic pathway, which is the major pathway, uh, the root itself uptake the iron, of course, including the heavy metal. So we try to take a deeper look, closer look, how root itself affecting the uptake of heavy metal. If we if we can somehow control or select um the rice root, that could somehow bar, okay, hinder the metal uptake from the wood itself. That would be perfect because we do not need to we do not need to do anything in the soil. So let's see, okay, if it's actually working well. And again, we, we focus on the root morphology, we focus on the root anatomy, okay? And the uh, ultimate goal, okay, ultimate dream is to screen, screen a nice, a suitable rice cultivar or rice stream, which could intrinsically accumulate low amounts of cadmium ring itself. Okay, so as I mentioned, the root uptake 
is the major, it's a key process. Okay, and also it's the first part. That's the heavy metal interacting with the plant itself. Once the plant, one heavy metal being active by the roots, okay, the heavy metal will just translocate, transporting within the whole plant. Okay, so that once the heavy metal going inside the root, we can't control. What we can control is to bar, to bar the heavy metal being uptake. That would be the only thing we could do. So we would like to see how cadmium is being uptake, okay? Or to compare whether uptake or translocation is more important, it's more important to the accumulation itself, okay? So, and for the cadmium translocation, we found that there are several pathways, cell to cell pathway and also apoplastic pathway. And we found that this apoplastic pathway would be the major pathway, as I mentioned, that's controlled the iron uptake, iron transport, that's including heavy metal. And we do believe that there was from some of the plant, some of the cultivar, it will form apoplastic area, just like a goat or uh, a keeper. Okay? It will hold the ball, it will hold the heavy metal. It will trap the heavy metal that's being transported up, okay, or even translocated from the root to the shoot. We would love to we would love to found this barrier, okay, where it could be observed in the root in different uh, uh, rice cultivar. Okay, let's see. Okay, uh, besides we also uh, investigate the root morphology, just like the tips, okay, the the hair roots, okay, the tips per surface surface area, the diameter of the root, so and so forth. And see whether they are also uh, incorporated. Okay, the process of the heavy metal accumulation. So a hypothesis, of course, we assume that um, the low hyper the low accumulating rice cultivar, they should have a stronger, okay, powerful root apoplastic barrier. Then they also possess different morphology, okay, and also anatomy uh, towards the uh, the heavy metal uptake, okay. And we try to um, select 22 rice cultivar in Guangdong province. They are very popular, okay, very popular. And they're also suitable uh, uh, the weather in Guangdong. So that we use them, we select them. And these are the rice cultivar name. Okay, some of them are Indica, some of them are Japonica. And we grow them uh, in a nutrient solution with the cadmium uh, 0 0.1 ppm for a certain period of time. And here shows the cadmium concentration in the shoot. Again, okay, you can see there's a trend okay, from the lower to the high concentration and the root as well. Okay, this means different strain, they may have different ability in accumulating the cadmium, okay? Ever in the shoot and the root. So, and we try to uh, identify, okay? We try to identify the one with low cadmium accumulating ability and also one with high cadmium accumulating ability. So that this JYT and ZXN is our target. So the cadmium concentration, we also uh, uh, calculate the translocation, okay? And we also find that this JYT and ZXN confirm that they are our good candidate to be test as a low accumulating uh, string and also high accumulating string to see if they have any difference in uptake, in uptake of pollutants. Right, okay. So if you still remember, JYT is a low accumulating uh, string, but in the uptake kinetics, uptake kinetics, this open circle, open circle is JYT. Okay, this also surprised us. This is a low accumulating string, but the uptake kinetic is higher than the high accumulating string. It's supposed to be thing, low accumulating ability should have low uh, uptake kinetics. So in this case, it's somehow not following our plan, okay? And by different modeling, we also found this low accumulator. They call it very high Vmax, okay? When compared to the high accumulating plants, high accumulating strength. So this is very interesting, okay? Besides, we also uh, do some morphology analysis, okay? For the JYT low accumulator string, they should have a less, okay, number of roots, 10 percent quip, but with a larger average diameter. So it seems that somehow we cannot get a good conclusion, okay? We cannot get a good conclusion. But, okay, when we take a closer and deeper look, okay, 
we found that this JYT, okay, low accumulating uh, string. Oh, we found this some colorful line. The blue, the red, the green, the brown, these are the apoplastic barrier, apoplastic barrier. These are the gold part, okay? And in particular, when the low accumulating string, okay, under uh, uh, cadmium concentration uh, condition, these barrier occur very, very early, especially around the apex, around the apex, because in the, during the apex, which is a very nice conviction, a nice place for metal, for the water being uptake. But these low accumulator, they start to develop this barrier. When compared to the high accumulator, this barrier will actually somehow uh, exceed, okay, occurred in a later period. So we, we found this uh, barrier actually working very well and also put a very significant role in uh, bar in hinder the metal uptake actually and also translocation. And with different staining, okay, we also can found this uh, apoplastic barrier is actually actually uh, working here. Besides, we also uh, try to trace here the the those heavy metal goals, okay, for the JYT, which is the the white bar. Most of the, most of the cadmium actually are bound intracellularly. Okay, for the JYT, low accumulator string. But for the high accumulator string, which is uh, which are the uh, black bar, which are in an apoplastic fluid. Apoplastic fluid, that means in an available form, that's being uptake okay, by the plant and eventually translocate and accumulate to the grain. So that's why uh, uh, translocation here is also a very important part. If we can bar the metal uptake by the apoplastic barrier, but if we cannot control, okay, to be uptake or to be bound by the intracellular uh, component, that is useless. To that, we found that the chemical concentration actually uh, in apoplastic barrier much higher uh, for the ZX and high accumulating strength prediction. Okay, so that's um, this JYT, they had more bound and intracellular. That's why it would not translocate further to the green itself. So the summary, we, we will say that the, the cadmium, uh, uh, the root morphology and also anatomy would be a very uh, a nice characterization for us to screen a suitable rice cultivar. Instead of we have to clean up the soil, we have to add a different amendment. But instead, if we can pre-screen, okay, select a suitable good uh, uh, low, cadmium, low cadmium accumulating strength uh, or cultivar, that would be nice enough for farmer to adopt it when even they found some pollutants in the, in the soil. Of course, with the uh, time limitation, I think I cannot uh, talk too much, but here I just share with you that uh, we also try to uh, consider different kinds of microbes, just like the iron oxidizing bacteria, how it's actually working with the arsenic uh, speciation, okay, with the organic arsenic, inorganic arsenic, so on and so forth as well as the prime growth for making rice bacteria or uh, the arsenic accumulation of prime growth, so on and so forth. So all these are some related research topic that you may find on the internet done by our research group. And recently we try not to just work in, in China. My PhD student actually come from uh, Bangladesh and then, you know, Bangladesh is a, is, a, is a country with quite a lot of arsenic contamination, especially underground water. And this contamination is not done by human activity, not by industrialization, urbanization, which is natural, natural in the groundwater. And they are colorless, tasteless, whatever you boil, you cook it, okay, you fly it, okay? The arsenic is still in the food, in the water. So that's my PhD student, actually he graduated already. And then uh, one, of, uh, one part of the research is to do a risk assessment. And then he found okay, uh, the health uh, uh, quotient for the farmers, for the citizens in, in, in the Bangladesh is pretty high, which is talking about uh, 2.8 to 100 people, and those 1.6 to 1,000 people are at risk. So that this is actually a very alarming health effect in the Bangladesh. Of course, we are not just uh, finding a problem. We try to use uh, some simple way to solve it, okay, and discuss with the farmer, of course. They don't want to apply different amendments because it needs some cost, some 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 operating operational cost. So that we try to work with the water. Okay, we have some treatment. 
uh, we call temporary store the groundwater. We, we just uh, simple, simply treat it, just store for over one night after those arsenic being oxidized. Basically, it can reduce availability. And eventually, we found that with this practice, um, the arsenic being uptake by the right could reduce up to uh, 60%, okay, which is also safe for the, for the consumption. So that's we well, uh, well welcome, okay, well received this by the farmer in Bangladesh. Of course, nowadays we also keep working with, with Bangladesh and to see if there are any further way to, to assist them uh, to, to come back with the arsenic contamination in the groundwater and the soil or even in, in the rice itself. Okay, so thank you so much and uh, welcome for some uh, quick question or sharing. Thank you. Okay, so now we open for questions um, from the floor and also from the internet. So who would like to ask the first question? Uh, yes, first. yes, yes. First of all, thank you for your presentation. It's very fruitful. Uh, I just wonder um, how long is the period of function about, uh, for example, still select a bunch mm. right. in the soil by irrigation? Uh, irrigation. Uh, if I want to restore uh, agricultural land, uh, which is contaminated by metal, if we base this the field repeatedly. Mm -hmm. How many times do we need to restore the agricultural soil? Oh, we actively remove that and remove this. I see. Yeah, this is a very practical question. Normally, uh, at this moment, for our research, we try to uh, apply the bow chart and with the rice cultivation. And we normally use two season, growing season. And basically after, within the two growing season, the performance of the biochar or this, um, this amendment is pretty nice. pretty nice. But for a longer season, we, we didn't try. But for my PhD student, actually, he will become a postdoc. He will, did a, he will consider to use a four or even five the, uh, the, the, the efficiency of the biochar. But of course, if you want to ensure that you add a little bit, because one day the biochar will be somehow set. They're using the uh, absorption and the But at least for two seasons, it's normally okay. For the, for the green season of rice, you mean three months or half? Normally for, for Hong Kong, uh, the growing season is talking about three months. Yeah, in Hong Kong, we've got two harvests per year. But in, in Bangladesh or in, in some Southeast Asian country, they may have three, three, three harvests. But of course, in China, just like in the northeastern part, they only got one season because of the weather. Okay, yes, please. Yes, please uh, speak louder. How, yeah. how do you deal with the Basically, uh, we do not need to work at it. You don't need to do any general living. So you just need uh, At the same time, if you want to ensure the fish, add a new one. Oh. Add a new one. Because the voucher itself is also kind of carbon source. Yeah. So that once it is saturated, basically the mat will just lock in the voucher. And we don't need to take it out. But and I know. Stable, you mean? Yeah, no, no problem. Because they are very stable. But I know there are some techniques. They will add some properties to the bio chart called magnetic. Magnetic that they can use some iron to, use to, to get it out. It will be, but at this moment, for pharma, I think they, they don't like this kind of characterization. Just leave it the soil. It's not, it will not further release, causing any other secondary. Okay, so any more questions from the floor or the, from the, over the internet? Yes, yes, please. How, how, how did you first identify? Oh yeah, this setting my friend, yeah. Because I still remember when I was a PhD student, uh, we have to run different metal mine, okay, in Hunan, Zhejiang, okay. And actually this is not the first discovery, actually, which is uh, firstly done by some Chinese scholar. But normally, one, once they discover, they won't tell people where you can find it. They just told you, oh, from Zhejiang metal mine. And then I just visited different Zhejiang metal mine and luck find this one. Because normally for the metal mine, the concentration of heavy metal is very high. Uh, you can see those soil are a kind of bare land, no grass, no flowers. But for these plants, 
they find something green in the soil, then maybe they have some potential as a, a tolerance or even hyper accumulation. That would be easy, something green, okay, with the biomolecule. You're using just uh, binocular, you can find that easily. So that we, we keep finding them for we'll say one month, okay, and we get it. Yes, please. Uh, it shows like how high the temperature. Hmm. Normally, we use around uh, 500, uh, 550 degrees Celsius, uh, and they burn it in the furnace to kind of paralyze the oxygen. This is pretty, pretty, pretty common, available in Hong Kong. Even for some, some for example, KFBG, we done it by the test one. Similar, similar paralysis. Of course, you can also compare by 400, 400 degrees Celsius, 500, 600 degrees Celsius. They may have different performance, different pricing. But 550, oh, okay, 500, 500 and 50 degrees Celsius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And any questions from the internet? I want to share some um, of my opinion. Because um, heavy metal contaminations, uh, uh, some are due to industrial pollution, right, such as cadmium. Some are naturally occur, like for example, aluminium. Mm -hmm. right? So they are, they are the most abundant right. elements in the earth, but they are not available most of the yes, time yeah. because they are Yeah, but in, in acidic soil, mm -hmm. um, the heavy metal become more active mm -hmm. and available. Right. So when we when you talk about the the rice uh cadmium contamination, mm -hmm. it's mainly in the southern part, southern provinces. Right. The yeah. rice has this uh, this problem, right? But I think there is a, a lot of um controversial approach because cadmium uptake is also related to other essential mm -hmm. mineral uptake. Yeah, right? zinc is important, right? So so when when you're trying to manipulate. So, so to make it uh, less, uh, the roots is less uh, available for metals and water, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, on one hand, maybe you can achieve uh, reducing heavy metal. But on the other hand, you may also reduce the use. Right. Yeah. So I I, I work on heavy metal when I'm a master student. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I I found a different mechanism mm -hmm. from, from a glass of a sugar blah, blah. Okay, which is a, a grass growing in in a, in a metal mine region mm -hmm. in, in UK. So they are also hyper accumulators, yeah. but they are accumulate in the roots. Oh, okay. And in the, uh, the upper part tissue mm -hmm. without transporting up to the upper parts. Mm -hmm. And I have some um, evidence showing that they have some phytochelatins oh, yeah. or methylphenin, yeah. which yeah. that okay. that trap everything mm -hmm. in the lower parts and then let the upper part. Going heavy. Yes. So, so there are some mechanism like that, and also maybe a mechanism like the the, the roots morphology that you mentioned. Right. But what? How about um, if you just want to help the farmer? Mm -hmm. So how about just screening for the rice that accumulate leaves? Yeah. Get uh, heavy metal and growing the best. Yes. Right? Because there may be multiple um mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So if more practical, right? Yeah, <laughs> Just true. go to the field and using a germism to screen will be more practical for the farmer. Yes, of course. This would be the uh, most easiest, easiest way. Just screen those rice cultivar with no accumulating material. But of course, uh, there is a dynamic low accumulation versus the yield. Let's see how the farmer will consider. They prefer to provide a safe rice by high yield rice at the same time with contamination. Because nowadays when we talk about human health, we are not just talking about the ill. Okay, it's actually, because the heavy metal, they, they cannot be degraded uh, in the human body. So we will somehow consider heavy metal concentration. Just let me be, I know in Hong Kong that we have some brand, Fa Yu Zai, so and so forth. If we can also do some screening to see if Fa Yu Zai is uh, a low, okay, or even high accumulator, then we are doing different from Hong Kong or even some do you think it's also important to map the contaminated sites? Because if, if we can uh, map it to, to uh, assess the 
concentration of plant matter, then we can have a better plan of agriculture. Right. Okay. Map it. Yeah, because uh, mm -hmm. you have to know which area has right. uh, all kinds of concentrations. Right, right. Different crops has a different accumulation ability. Rice is very strong, right? yeah. but some some crop accum accumulate much less than this. But of first, of course, I think uh, growing rice in the metal mine uh, is not our first choice, right? Because this is somehow uh, impossible. Okay? But somehow, you know, uh, the rice. I mean, the farmland in our research basically they are not at the in the middle of metal mine. They are just around the metal mine, especially the first part, uh, the Guizhou metal mine containing cadmium and mercury, which is talking actually about one kilometer away from the metal mine. So that I think, yes, we have to do a soil map, okay? For example, to see the, the metal concentration, but to find a good place for the practice. But first, I think we, we should not grow the rice in the, in the metal mine. I, I think even we grow it, I think no people would like to buy it. Any further questions? Uh, uh, I, I do have a question. Yes, Mandy. Yeah. Um, is it possible to grow hyper accumulating, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the cadmium plants mm -hmm. with the rice together so that one, one plant will actually soak up the, right. soak up the cadmium yeah. and while yeah. the while, while you can grow the rice as well? Right. Uh... This is a very nice idea. In old days, we have similar concept. That's mean the hyper accumulating rice, hyper accumulating plants grow with the rice. Let's see how they competing, okay? Competing at uptake. But uh, it seems not easy because for rice, uh, the growing condition is flooding, it's flooding. And most of the hyper accumulator, uh, so far we know, they somehow not growing, not growing well under flooding condition. So that mm -hmm. rye is a some a kind of a loner, okay? So it's, they, they can't grow well with the hyper accumulator. But we have some successful case. That is growing the hyper accumulator with the maize, with the maize. And mm -hmm. in China, we found that, oh, that's nice. Uh, next to the maize, we have the hyper accumulator. Then most of the heavy metal being picked first by the hyper accumulator and the maize will grow in a safe condition, so-called safe condition. This is nice for maize, but not for rice, basically. Okay. So uh, one more one more question is that after you keep growing all these uh, hyper accumulating plants, mm -hmm. um, it actually will help you to clean up the soil, mm. correct? Right. Okay. So eventually, the soil will be good for any, you know, right. any crops. Right. But okay. you know, there are some uh, limitation. It takes long time. Talk about okay. five to ten years, and we have to remember that if the Right. I mean, if the hyper accumulating plants, especially the root, if the area of the soil that is not being contacted by that plant, then the gluten somehow could not be easily being uptake. So that it also depends on the plant size. That's why we have to uh, use a long time to to for the hyper for the for the cleanup. And also, in the middle, we have to mix the soil. Okay, to ensure okay uh, uh, the metal is well, okay, it's, it's in a, it's, I mean, everything is in a good condition, okay, instead of just, oh, the shallow depth is being cleaned up, but most of heavy metal is actually in the, in the bottom, so we have to make it upside down and also be up again. So it's also a manpower issue, and at the same time, we cannot do anything, no agriculture. So that's why this phyto remediation somehow, uh, I would not encourage for the farmer. Hmm. But, um. Now, uh, you did mention something about the, the hyper-accumulating plants, is that once they accumulate the heavy metals, you can actually mine the plants for the metal. Am right. I correct? Right, right. Yes. Metal mining. Huh. So is it possible that, you know, instead of the farmer growing that, and if they can work with uh, some kind of uh, mining corporations, then they could have a good livelihood instead of going in and at the same time clean up the land? Hmm. Oh, this is a nice idea. I, I never thought about it. But, uh, well, uh, it, they could somehow get money, but um, they have to wait for five to 10 years first. <laughs> yeah, but five to 10 years is actually not too long when you talk about, you know, you hmm. know it, it, it is long in, in short term because, right. you know, when you're looking about money and income, hmm. but then in the long term for any business, 
five to ten years is not long at all. Right. Good. I think in an economical perspective, they might be feasible. I, I didn't think about it. <laughs> so your idea. Maybe we can make it. We can think about it uh, by uh, estimate the amount being obtained and also calculate the efficiency whether it is feasible to get the money instead of just farm instead of just yeah. doing. Money. I think that would be a, a you know for your research for your for your PhD students to look into it. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Maybe you get money. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can get some money. It's a rare earth. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Can I, yes. Can I ask can you any research on how much mean the better? Oh, let me see. Because uh, for those heavy metal mine, okay, I mean the, the, the soil with heavy metal contamination, the yield is significantly being affected when compared to the control. Oh. Basically. But once we add the biochar or the bacteria, we oh. found that the yield um, didn't increase very, very much. Not talking about first of all, I'm not talking, but at least maybe 20%, 30%, at least. But at the same time, we are mainly concerned on the, the cost. Maybe the last dream is to produce a safe rice and high yield. That would be best. Not, we cannot do this at this moment. Yes, please. Can you mention about the heavy metal in the rice grain? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there any, is it even a distributed? Only in the rice grain. In the rice okay. grain. But Not how about the husk? The husk, actually, the husk contains very little amount of oh. it. Really? In the grain. grain. This is the white part of the grain. So, yes, add it in the part. They have some of the, uh, in the husk in the stem. A oh, little bit, but it's okay. But, but then, uh, brown rice, mm -hmm. rice being, you know. Oh, the total part, total part, I mean, the total part. Oh, wow. Jump, jump, uh, jump, 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 uh, unbuilt, unbuilt one. Unbuilt so, one. So with, with some, um, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Surrounded. Yeah. Post -surrounded. So, 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 so I think the question is, uh, compared to the white rice, so will the white rice has less, uh, no. what was actually, oh, because okay. which major part. So it's just that your research is done on the brown rice. Yes, but also so even though we we take out the food. Okay. All right. Well, I guess uh, it's time to say good night. <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining. So uh, we'll well uh, we'll announce the next talk later through the email to everybody. So thank you for joining us today. Okay. So. You. Hi, bye bye, Wendy. Bye bye. <laughs> okay, <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Okay, see you.